You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Hi, listeners. Before I start on the news for today, just a quick heads up. Are you a fellow catastrophizer? Do you really, really not need to know new, fun, and exotic ways to potentially die because you've already kind of got a long list? Then you might want to hang on tight for this next one because, yay, new nightmare fuel just dropped. T-minus. 20 seconds to LOS. T-dress. Go for the floor. Today is October 16th, 2023. I'm Maria Varmazas, and this is T Minus. The FAA releases a paper on the risks associated with re entry disposal of satellites. SpaceX launches twice in one day from Florida. ISRO says the U.S. wants its space tech. And T-Minus is heading to Ascend in Las Vegas next week. So all week this week, we'll be featuring speakers from the event, starting with Scout Space's CEO, Eric Ingram. And now on to today's intelligence briefing. The FAA has been noticing that the number of satellites in low Earth orbit has mushroomed as of late and thought, hmm, has anyone looked into the numbers of how that many satellites might impact us here on Earth should they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and not entirely burn up? Yeah, so the FAA contracted the Aerospace Corporation to look into this and do the math. The report from the FAA took a close look especially at Starlink satellites because, well, there are a lot of them. And the report says that, yes, SpaceX's Starlink satellites are designed to fully burn up, or in the lingo, demise, on reentry. So should that hold true, the risk of space debris to those of us on Earth should remain zero. However, the FAA and the Aerospace Corporation's report argues that despite SpaceX's claim of fully demisable Starlink satellites, inevitably, statistically, some don't burn up completely as designed. So, if you multiply those edge cases by the sheer number of Starlink satellites expected by, oh, I don't know, 2035, and the numbers aren't exactly great news as we seek to put more and more and more satellites into LEO. So the new report from the FAA to Congress says that by 2035, if the number of satellite constellations grows to projected levels, and I'm going to quote the FAA executive summary here, 85% of the expected risk to people on the ground and aviation from re-entering debris in 2035 are from Starlink satellites. If that happens, the report projects that, quote, The total number of hazardous fragments surviving re-entries each year is expected to reach 28,000, and the casualty expectation, which is the number of individuals on the ground predicted to be injured or killed by debris surviving the re-entries of satellites being disposed from these constellations, 
would be 0.6 per year, which means that one person on the planet would be expected to be injured or killed every two years. But wait, there's more! The report goes on to say this, quote, Some debris fragments would also be a hazard to people in aircraft. Projecting 2019 global air traffic to 2035 and assuming that a fragment that would injure or kill a person on the ground would also be capable of fatally damaging an aircraft, the probability of an aircraft downing accident, defined an aerospace report as a collision with an aircraft downing object in 2035, would be 0.0007 per year, end quote. Well, that is lovely Monday morning reading, especially as the United States and China are working fast on their own military satellite constellations in LEO to say nothing of global businesses like OneWeb and Amazon's Project Kuiper and, of course, the aforementioned Starlink owning SpaceX, which, as you can imagine, really took issue with being directly called out in this report and wrote their own response directly to Congress. And the letter from SpaceX, obtained by Ars Technica, was penned by SpaceX principal engineer David Goldstein and says the report by the FAA, quote, relied in error on a deeply flawed analysis that falsely characterizes reentry disposal risks associated with Starlink while failing to evaluate reentry disposal from any other large constellation operator, whether U.S. or foreign, end quote. The letter goes on to refute some base assumptions in the FAA's report, saying that it relies on, quote, flawed methods and outdated studies developed decades ago, and that, crucially, current Starlink satellites have a, quote, greater than 99% success rate for post-mission disposal. SpaceX, I want to believe. I really do. And listeners, you can do the reading and form your own conclusions on this one. We have links to the FAA's report as well as SpaceX's response letter in our show notes. Moving on. U.S. federal departments and agencies gathered at a workshop last week to explore opportunities and potentially pivotal programs for collaborative low-Earth orbit research. According to the White House, the participants discussed safety protocols and standards to ensure timely access and flight safety to, within, and through LEO, among other opportunities for research and development. I've got to wonder if the FAA report was mentioned at all. And we mentioned on Friday the SpaceX liftoff transporting Psyche on the first leg of its mission to the asteroid of the same name, But most impressively, it wasn't the only SpaceX mission on Friday. And it wasn't even the only launch in Florida. Eight hours and 42 minutes after the Falcon Heavy launched the Psyche mission, a Falcon 9 carrying another 22 Starlink internet satellites into space lifted off. It was the 56th launch from the Space Coast this year, just one launch shy of the record from the total number of launches in 2022. India's space research organization chairman S. Somanath says the U.S. has appealed to India to share space technology with them after seeing the development of the Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft. Speaking at an event over the weekend, ISRO head S. Somanath said that five or six people from NASA JPL came to ISRO headquarters before the soft landing took place on August 23rd. S. Somanath told the crowd, quote, We explained how we designed Chandrayaan-3 and how our engineers made it and how we're going to land on the moon's surface, and they just said, no comments, everything's going to be good. He went on to say that the NASA employees asked him if they would sell the technology to America. Canberra-based space technology company Skycraft has raised $120 million Australian dollars to fuel its ambitious aviation satellite vision. Skycraft aims to improve communications between air traffic control and aircraft flying over remote areas through their satellite communication constellation. The company has spent two years raising the funds needed to get hundreds of its satellites into low Earth orbit. Skycraft launched their first satellites to orbit on a SpaceX rocket in January, with a second batch joining them in June. China launched a new Earth observation satellite over the weekend. A long March 2D rocket transported the Yunhai-104 satellite to orbit. China says the satellite will provide detection services of the atmosphere, sea, and space, and will provide information that would aid disaster prevention and mitigation. And China has announced that it plans to launch its next Shenzhou-17 spacecraft this month. 
The next generation of the Shenzhou vehicle will head to Tiangong Space Station, docking with the forward port of the Tianhe core module of the China Space Station, forming a combination of three modules and three spaceships. Indian satellite company Dhruva Space has announced that it will soon start the construction of a 280,000 square foot manufacturing facility in Hyderabad. Dhruva expects to manufacture, assemble, and test large-scale satellite infrastructure at the new site. The building is expected to be completed in the next 18 to 24 months. And that concludes our briefing for today. You'll find links to further reading on all the stories we've mentioned in our show notes. And we've added a Wall Street Journal article on ongoing spectrum legal arguments in the U.S. for some extra light reading. Hey, T-Minus crew. Every Monday, we produce a written intelligence roundup, and it's called Signals and Space. So if you happen to miss any T-Minus episodes, this strategic intelligence product will get you up to speed in the fastest way possible. It's all signal, no noise. You can sign up for Signals in Space in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. And now a word from our sponsor, Six Sense. Sixth Sense provides award-winning cloud-based automated endpoint and vulnerability management solutions to streamline IT and security operations. With its advanced platform, businesses gain complete visibility and control over their infrastructure, reducing IT and security risks and optimizing operational efficiency. With Sixth Sense, you'll get real-time alerts, risk-based vulnerability prioritization and remediations, and an intuitive automation and orchestration engine so you can focus on your core business goals, confident in the knowledge that your enterprise is secure, compliant, and running smoothly. Visit SixSense.com to learn why enterprises choose them. T-Minus is heading to Ascend in Las Vegas on October 23rd through 25th. So this week, we're featuring speakers from the event, starting with Scout Space's CEO, Eric Ingram. And I started off by asking Eric to explain the mission of Scout Space. Scout is an acronym or a backronym, we're not sure which one, um, that stands for Spacecraft Observing and Understanding Things. So we like to make it a a cheeky, easy-to-define thing about what we're doing. But spacecraft autonomy is definitely an area of focus for the company. You could think about it the same vision systems and software that a Tesla uses to uh, navigate autonomously. Um, We're developing uh, similar things, but for satellites. And space is pretty crowded, and it's going to get... uh, quite a bit more crowded over the next decade. The number of active satellites in orbit is expected to increase 40x in that time. The way spacecraft usually move is with human-in-the-loop operations to reduce risk, or at least previously, you know, a human basically had to be there to uh, sign off or digitally sign off on what the maneuver is and make sure things are going well. As you increase the quantity of maneuvers happening in space, and as you increase the complexity of those maneuvers, especially with things like satellite servicing becoming uh, the norm, hopefully, human in the loop actually invites more risk. The timelines and distances associated with these maneuvers are um, ones that the, the latency involved with having a human click the ne- you know go to next step button are risky and invites danger and invites mistakes. So especially with the rapid increase in compute power and capabilities with machine learning and computer vision, all that fun stuff. This is an area that is uh, ripe for modernization. And I think uh, we're, we're doing a pretty good job at making it there. So when I think about um, where we are right now in terms of safety in space, how do we get to the goal of having our satellites not have all these near misses? And how do we get to that place we really need to be? The short answer is being collectively proactive. Unfortunately, humanity is not really a very proactive species, but we're at a point right now where we've not yet crossed the precipice 
that ends us in the, the Wally future where space is unusable. So we have time now where we can put norms in place, regulations, common practices, work on these things that can get us all on the same page about how to sustainably operate in orbit and the things we need to do to ensure the utility of that commons in the future. You know, it's going to come down to business agreements. It's going to come down to regulations. It's going to come down to industry groups. It's going to come down to politics. A lot of that stuff and technology and a lot of that interconnects and interweaves to make it a very complex ecosystem. But, you know, if we have these channels of dialogue where we're able to share data, share knowledge about the things around us and work towards common understanding of what's going on in orbit so that we can all at least have the same baseline understanding of what's happening around all of our assets in orbit. That is the first step. In addition to all the other first steps, you know, there's a lot of good conversations going on. FCC, I think, just issued their first ever fine about uh, improper leaving of a spacecraft in orbit. And so there's the mindset is shifting. It's just a matter of whether we can collectively get there quick enough to ensure we don't have cleanup to do. Let's let's get into a little bit on, on what you at Scout are actually doing, like what the technology is that you're deploying, how, how you are approaching this problem. We touched on it a little bit, but could we get a little bit more into detail, please? So we are developing vision capabilities for satellites. Um, what that practically means is uh, we are developing the vision systems, meaning the actual payloads that go on board customer spacecraft and the uh, software to make them smart. Most of our IP is on the software side, but unfortunately, most satellites don't have the sensors and compute on board to handle what we need to do. So we develop um, uh, vision systems, which again, comprise of cameras and uh, computer board, which houses all of our capabilities. We connect directly with the host spacecraft that we're on to better enable or augment their mission. So with these systems, they can either utilize them for relative navigation for things like satellite servicing, or they can be used for long range observations like space domain awareness in different orbital regimes. Those payloads in turn work as data collectors for us. So um, we can utilize that data to not only train our models to to make them better, so we can always be improving in our mission, but we can um, then repackage that data and and provide it to additional customer bases for their uses. So i.e. things like space traffic management, um, national security related things, and uh, everything in between. That's such a fascinating approach. And I would love to know a little bit about how you thought of that approach, because it's not the way I often hear people trying to crack that nut, so to speak. So it's a really interesting way of doing things. The space industry is funny in that they're not always open to things that have worked in other industries. So the model we utilize is not that much different from like a cell phone carrier. They sell you the phone and then they charge you for the data. But, you know, you have the phone and you can use the phone whatever you, for whatever you want. But then you're paying for the data each month, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's plenty of other different industry examples that are similar to that. So what we tried to do is look at innovative ways that we can incorporate proven business models in other industries into space. And um, we're actually finding a lot of traction with us. So we, we've already had, got several um, commercial partners who uh, either have or will have our vision systems on board their spacecraft and providing them services and capabilities while also collecting that data, which we can then share with um, other customer bases down the road. So we're able to generate revenue on, for the payload itself, but then generate hopefully recurring revenue on the data collected by those payloads. So um, long-term benefit to both us and the host customer, and hopefully um, for uh, the entirety of the space ecosystem as well, because more data is more knowledge, and more knowledge is less risk. So I'm going to totally switch topics now. Uh, at the end of this month, I know you'll be at Ascend in Vegas, and you will be moderating a panel there. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, that panel that uh, our listeners can look forward to? The panel I'm hosting is on who gets the right of way in space. There are no industry standards. There is not a fully fleshed out regulatory ecosystem for what you're supposed to do in orbit. And this conversation is, is with um, government 
personnel. It's with um, in-space propulsion providers, uh, data collectors from ground-based data sources, and the users of the space commons, and trying to come to a consensus on what the pathway is forward. It's going to be a long time before we have fully fleshed out regulations in place. It's going to be a while before every nation gets on board with something like that. But what can we utilize in the meantime? Can we stand up standards and norms of operations which can inform those uh, regulatory developments and things like that? The more we can prove out on the commercial side before there is government intervention, the more we can either inform that regulatory development or ease the restrictions caused by those regulations. And um, then it's, you know, what do we use as those frameworks? So slight preface, one of the things I'm going to be asking about is how do we relate it to analogous ecosystems on Earth? So um, it's not going to be like air traffic management. We're not going to have uh, space traffic controllers sitting at every orbit, you know, telling which satellite to go where. But will it be something like maritime law, the way that that has evolved over the last 600 years or so? And, you know, I'm looking to get some hopefully exciting insight from the other panelists. I'm, I'm going to try to ask some hard hitting questions that will, uh, you know, hopefully shake them up a little bit and get some fun responses. But um, this is something we all need to figure out because it doesn't matter whether you are a spacecraft owner or operator, if you're going to use space for any reason, ensuring that humanity is using it safely and sustainably is uh, of utmost importance. And that panel is on Monday, October 23rd for our listeners who are attending Ascent. I wanted to bring it back to something you mentioned at the beginning. I know making space accessible is something that you have done a lot of work in. It's something you talk a lot about, and I would be remiss not to ask you about that. Could you talk a little bit about any progress that has been made in that arena in the last few years? Has there been any progress there? Like, what's been going on with with, uh, making space more accessible? Yeah, there's been a lot happening. We did fly a second official flight in December of last year of which I took part and I was leading the mobility impairment group. And what we're really working on is uh, buying down risk for people with disabilities to go currently on suborbital space flights. So one of the big concerns by the suborbital space flight providers is the ability for someone with a mobility impairment or visual impairment to get in and out of their seat safely in microgravity and make sure they're able to re-affix their harnesses in microgravity. And so the experiment I led uh, in December was we developed analogous seats that are similar to Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. Uh, And for 15 parabolas, we practiced getting in and out of those seats in microgravity. And what we found, um, I mean, qualitatively, I don't know if we've quantified everything, is is we have had zero known failures to um, safely ingress and egress the seats, which is huge. Um, That data set just didn't exist before. And while it sounds simple, stuff like that goes a long way in reducing the nerves associated with the unknown. And I'm happy to say Astra Access has ongoing conversations with pretty much almost every human spaceflight company in some way, shape, or form. And we're hoping to get more interactions with all of them, and hopefully they incorporate um, our findings into their designs. And um, you know, hope we're, we're going to work one day, not just to do um, parabolic flights on the zero G airplane, but hopefully get someone into space here in the next few years. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service Program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. 
Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Welcome back. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Buzz Lightyear is joining the Space Force after hearing the next headline, America officially has its first Space Ranger. No, Pixar isn't taking over, but Virgin Galactic is the only company with a former Disney exec in charge, as far as we know. But Captain Daniel Reynolds graduated from the U.S. military's Ranger School, becoming the first Space Force guardian to earn a Ranger tab. Now, if you don't know what Ranger School is... It's an elite leadership school, and graduating from it is a distinct and rare honor. And to do just that, just think of the absolutely hardest military exercises you can possibly imagine, and it's harder than that. The phrase, train to exhaustion, gets invoked a lot. So, back to Reynolds. He currently serves as a test director with 4th Test and Evaluation Squadron Space Delta-12, and as a ranger he'll be helping to test the Space Force's satellite communications capabilities. And as if all that wasn't impressive enough on its own, he also holds a Master's of Science from MIT. So congratulations to Captain Reynolds on becoming the United States' first Space Ranger. I have a feeling we'll be hearing about more achievements from him in the future, perhaps to infinity and beyond. That's it for T-Minus for October 16th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karpf. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.